Well, hello. I'm Sarah Gordon, and I'm a senior research scientist at Symantec. And this is the title of my talk, Antivirus Software Test, What You Need to Know. I tend to speak really, really quickly, so if I start going too fast, you raise your hand. I'll try and slow down, but I just tend to talk really, really fast. Um, how do people evaluate software? That's something that question people often ask me. And I think that when you, what? A little hard to hear. I don't know who the, the people are who addressed it. Um, when you talk, people ask me, they're louder. People ask me often, um, how do you evaluate software? Everybody says they're the fastest, they have the best response, they have the best detection. So how do you really know? There are a couple of ways. Home users, and probably most of you aren't home users, but home users look at recommendations from friends, coworkers, what they use at work. Maybe the software was on their computer when they bought it. They've never updated it. Maybe it's the box. Maybe they like yellow boxes or red boxes or blue boxes or, or black boxes. Maybe it's certification logos, check marks, awards. Um, sometimes people attempt to do the test at home of the antivirus software, and that's a bad idea for a number of reasons, mainly because they tend to go and get a lot of things off the internet and test against them, and often these are just simply text files or non-replicating programs. They're not really doing any tests. And, they're putting themselves at a huge liability if they do happen to be viruses and get away. Corporate or enterprise users, which probably most of you are, really kind of the same way. The CTO at the company talks to somebody at another company and says, you know, oh, this antivirus product really did a great job for me when my doom was out there, so you should think about switching, you know, talk to your, talk to your people at your organization. Or the IT guy says, you know, I know you had a really problem with Sasser, but the OrScan really caught it when it came through our place, so you should take a look. Maybe your organization is running antivirus software that was there before you got there, and your needs have never really been reassessed. Price, the same as with the home user. People are interested in how much it costs, although you're probably looking also at the total cost of ownership, not just the price you pay for your licensing. Uh, boxes, corporations also look at boxes, trade shows. We have the little semantic guys there in the yellow. I have this up because I was at a show and I saw this man, he got all wrapped up in change and he was hanging upside down and he was supposed to be a blended threat. And when he escaped, you know, the guys in yellow came in and caught him. Very effective people remember that sorts of thing. And then there were tests, which is what we're going to talk about. Tests are done by commercial organizations, private entities, academic institutions, magazines, and sometimes in-house. A mission for this talk, because uh, I tend to like Star Trek, and there's also a Star Trek conference going on. Uh, so our mission is to put certification and testing of antivirus software into perspective so you can understand who is actually doing the testing, what they're testing, and what they're not testing, which is also very important, how they're doing the test, and what they're not doing, and what this means to you. And to do that, we're going to take a look at some examples, which um, may be surprising. They certainly were when I started looking through some examples of testing. Why should you listen to me? Well. I've worked for lots of people with viruses. Most of you who I've talked to here are real familiar with the work I've done on virus writers and the intersection of terrorism with technology. But I've also done a lot of work, scientific work, with testing criteria and methodology. Before coming to Symantec, I worked with IBM Research and Command Software. I managed the in-house in the wild virus libraries and response testing. I've done lots of academic type papers analyzing the state of the art of testing in the United States, EU, and UK. I've done this for lots of conferences, which you can see all about. Um, I work currently as the technical liaison with the UK IT set group, which isn't doing much now, ICSA West Coast Labs Virus Bowl and University of Magdeburg and Hamburg. I, I'm the technical director of ICAR, which developed the ICAR test trial. I also have academic independent um, credentials, which include a PhD thesis on scientific testing criteria and methodology, among other things. So I've got lots of different experiences related to testing, and they're mostly in the very independent experiences which you can go out and verify for yourself if you wish. So tests are important. What makes a good test? First of all, testing has to be scientific. In order for a test to be scientific, it has to be valid and reproducible and reliable. By validity, we mean the test has to measure the thing which it purports to measure. By reliable, we mean that it does this repeatably. It does it over and over. You can reproduce this test result. A scientific test should be very well documented, and that documentation should be available for peer review. People should be able to come in and say, oh, I see that there's validity, and I can analyze this by logically going through the testing process. I see that it's reliable and repeatable, and the, sound, the criteria and methodology are sound. 
In, or, in addition to being scientific, which is first criteria, it needs to be meaningful. So the critical question that you need to be asking yourself is does it measure something that's actually important to you? And the one caveat that I'd like to put right at the very beginning is it doesn't matter how in-depth the test is, we're going to look at some pretty in-depth analysis of performance of software. It does not matter how in-depth the test is if it's not meaningful, if it's not measuring something that matters to you. For a test to be a good test, it has to have both of these things, scientificness and meaningfulness. I've organized the presentation sort of with a, a sports theme in addition to the Star Trek theme. We're going to look at the people who do testing, and I call these the teams. There are universities, there are commercial entities, there are independent groups, there are magazine testers, and there are people that do tests in-house. We're not going to talk too much about the people that do tests in-house. It's a very much more complicated topic, and I would be happy to talk about that with you in email, but it would take several hours to do here. So we want to, now we'll just look at these four groups of people. And for those of you who prefer graphics, these are the logos that you might see on the boxes or in the magazines or when you get literature of the people who do test. Now, who can tell me which of these groups, just by looking at the graphics, is the academic bunch of testers? It's the ones with, the, with that kind of hand-painted little wormy logos and people looking out. Those are the academic testers. And so how many of you are familiar with some, at least some of these logos? You've seen some of them? OK, great. That's good. The first one we'll talk about and mention is the University of Hamburg. And uh, the person who organizes these tests is Dr. Professor Klaus Brunstein. He's the president of the International Federation for Information Processing. He's a very, very good security guy. He supervises uh, assorted students in bachelor's, master's, and PhD programs. And internships are provided with various vendors through the University of Hamburg tests. Our uh, second university tester is the University of Tampere. They don't do a lot of tests, but it's worth mentioning just because it's been around for such a very long time. Uh, Dr. Helenius primarily does security publication. The University of Magdeburg is a relatively new player on the testing scene. Andreas Marx has just completed his bachelor's degree in information technology, and he is working toward a master's degree. The, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but this university in Austria, Andreas Clementi, is working on his undergraduate degree in business informatics, electronics, and electrotechnics. These are the people that supervise the tests in the university environment. They're the ones who are supervising the students. In the commercial and for-profit arena, the people who do the tests are Bruce Hughes. And we, we weren't able to get back a response on the all the qualifications of everyone that we'll talk about. Um, but, so I'm not sure about Bruce Hughes. But he's, he's been doing this for an extremely long time. And he also works with the Wildlist Organization. How many of you are familiar with the Wildlist and the Wildlist Organization? Okay, the Wildlist Organization was founded to independently keep track of the viruses spreading in the wild. It was recently acquired by the ICSA, who now manages it, and Bruce Hughes is in charge of managing it for them. There's West Coast Publishing, Michael Parsons, who works in their lab, has a degree from Oxford. I'm not sure what it's in. And there's the labs manager, who I don't know the name of, who has a university honors degree in math and social science. And there's Virus Bulletin, Matt Hamm, who has graduate level degrees in lots of things, including genetic engineering, education, and I learned last night uh, religion and history. Now, it's not so important that people have degrees in computer science to be able to do this sort of testing. What's important is that they've shown by their life experience they have the ability to think in a certain way. So it's not what they think, it's that they've learned how to think. And you can see that most of these people are really learning how to think about, about processes and how things fit together. Um, specialist testers, there aren't a lot of these. Um, I highlight Florida Institute of Technology and Security Innovations. Um, Dr. Ford and Dr. Whitaker have lots of qualifications. Dr. Ford, in addition to being my husband, was the editor of Virus Bulletin, director of research at ICSA, worked at IBM Research, and did all of these things all to do with viruses. They now do testing for private industry and governmental organizations, but you won't read about these generally in magazines. And there are magazine testers. Virus Bulletin falls somewhat into the commercial area because I believe people do pay to use the logo when a product is certified with a VB100, but the tests are not charged for. Um, there's also a magazine that talks about viruses and virus analysis in detail, Virus Bulletin, and they also put on conferences. And there are generalist magazines that don't have the speciality of Virus Bulletin. Virus Bulletin is an excellent publication. If you don't subscribe to it, you might want to consider doing that. Lots of good information. PC World, PC Wealth, if it's the German version, CHIP. Andreas Marx, who also works at the university, 
doing testing and now has a corporation that is no longer affiliated with the university doing testing, writes for a number of these magazines. In addition to Andreas, there are a number of people who do tests of antivirus software in magazines. Often these people test printers one week, modems next week, maybe they test in cards, land cards the next week, so they don't really have a lot of detailed experience in the testing process. They're the non-specialists. So now you know who the players are. We should look a little bit at the game, which is testing. The goal of a test is to assess performance. So we're going to look a little bit at what's being tested, the rules of the methods, how they're testing it, and the score, what this means to you, the pros and cons, and how it affects you in your day-to-day -day operations. Univ University of Hamburg has a very sound criteria methodology. They do tests against all the viruses that are found spreading in the wild. To do this, they use something called the wild core, which the first one was replicated in the middle 1990s. I actually replicated it for a wildlife organization. Uh, it's distributed to all of the vendors and testers. It consists of samples that have been sent in, uh, provided to the vendors. They've been replicated, sent into the wildlife organization. Then these are resupplied to the testers who test to see if everyone is able to detect replicants of these viruses. So the University of Hamburg test, does test against this. They also have a huge um, collection of viruses called the virus zoo. These are viruses which have not been found in the wild and aren't very likely to be found in the wild. They test the performance in a number of archivers, which are chosen in a number of different ways. We'll look a little bit at what some of those archivers are in a little bit. Um, they test something called a Eureka test or a heuristic, looking to see if a program would have detected a virus at the time it came out using a signature which was current at the time the virus came out. They test against non-viral malware and Trojans, and they have a, a, some false positives tests. That means, does the product say there's a virus when there really isn't any? Because if this happens in your organization, because that's kind of a problem. It stops all of, your, all of your work. Now, if you'll remember the two criteria for a good test, are they scientific? And are they meaningful? In the area of being scientific, these are valid, reliable, reproducible tests. They're extremely well documented. The vendors are able to work closely with the university to do a peer review of the tests. They have sound criteria and methodology, so they are scientific. But there can be quite a lot to digest. If you look at the, the list, when you start reading the reports from the University of Hamburg, you see you have to look really close to read, concerning our hardware, we still use very old computers. We'd like to thank, and then they name some vendors. And we use six popular packers, ZIP, LHA, R, RAR, WinRAR, TAB. So you need to really be able to look at a lot of information. It's not just a lot of information, it's a lot and a lot of information. Only one report of the file and macrovirus test is used to get the total number of files. As for boot virus, the configuration of SimBoot is used. Now that can be a problem because it's not an actual virus. And the way, um, the way that IBM antivirus worked years ago was it would only detect a virus if it's a real virus. It doesn't care about a simulated virus. We want to see if a product will perform in the real world in a real environment. So a product can fail against the simulation. It doesn't mean it would fail in the real world. But you have to be able to really drill down. And you have to do it for a long time. And pretty soon your eyes start to blur because there are lots of numbers. Scan 5.0 and the print gets smaller and smaller. And pretty soon it's all just one big blur. It's just really kind of too much to read. You can't see, but there's even more little tiny text there. So the critical question here is, does this measure something important to you? Well, you have to be able to really look at a lot of information to find that out. There's some questions. Does a 3% difference in detection really matter? If that 3% difference in detection is difference toward one particular file extension that you have a lot of, it probably matters. If it's 3% here and 3% there and people are running pretty close, it may not really matter at all, especially if it's in a zoo collection of something that you're not likely to see. So you can look at numbers and look at the final scores on the doors and get a very biased look at how that product really performs because you're not looking at what's important to you, what that 3% actually measures. To know that, you have to look down, down, down into all this information. When you're looking at testing within archives, how are they chosen? Are they archive, archivists that are, you actually use in your organization? Non-viral malware, you have to look at this a product designed to detect it. I mean, it would be great if antivirus software could do everything, including making your toast and coffee in the morning, but the fact is, it's designed with a very specific purpose in mind. So you need to look at, is the product being tested, is, is it being tested in the way it's designed to be used, or isn't it? And more importantly, you need to look at what's not being measured. 
The academic tests at the University of Hamburg are a picture of performance over time. The tests are sporadic because it is a university environment. There can be huge gaps in time as new students come in to do these tests. So you're going to have a test maybe a year before there's another test. The tests are sporadic. And performance in the real world is not likely you're going to hopefully have, won't have 80,000 infections on your computer. The zoos aren't weighted, so you could miss an entire type of virus that you would never know from looking at these tests. And it, the tests aren't able to tell you if the integration of other solutions might address the problem. Again, it doesn't matter how in-depth a test is, if it's not scientific and meaningful. These tests are both, but it's up to you to assess if it's meaningful to you. University of Magdeburg's relative newcomer, they also test using in the wild viruses, and they also use a replicated wild core, but they do additional tests of malware and Trojan horses, including some modifications of files which don't always represent what you're likely to find in the real world. Now, some people say, well, why shouldn't we, you know, virus writers, they may write a virus, so let's write one and see if the product det will detect it. It's not considered good practice to write a virus for testing. You want to see if the product will perform, how it will perform in the real world, and that's the virus that you're likely to actually get. So the in the wild tests are really still the best baseline for that. So Andreas Marx and University of Magdeburg, which is now AV test, no longer affiliated with the university since I started putting these slides together, um, but still doing some work with the university. They do a number of these tests. Are they scientific? Because these, this tester works a great deal with magazines, it's really important when you read these tests that you an analyze the dual relationships that exist. The magazine will often suggest and select the criteria, so the tester may have no control. And the magazines aren't always specialists in the area of antivirus testing. They may require specially created or modified samples, which aren't going to represent what you're likely to encounter in the real world, but it makes for very sexy reading, and people like to read very sexy things about security in magazines, so it looks good. There are likely to be non-weighted zoo samples. Again, you may find that a product misses one particular sort of virus, but you'll never find that out because the samples aren't weighted. The information is not always peer-reviewed. Generally, we're able to discuss test with the people who are doing the testing. If they find a problem, say, oh, maybe you, know, you need to look at this way or you didn't have this configuration. But when you're working in this environment, you don't always have that opportunity. The documentation from University of Magdeburg is still under development. It's primarily in German. My German is very limited to doppelganger, bratwurst, and gestalt. I can't really interpret these tests. Um, if your primary language is German, you can probably do a lot of interpretation of these tests. I can't do it. Um, the documentation in the magazine varies magazine to magazine, and the interpretation varies depending on the fact that in some cases the tester may not write the interpretation of the tests. In the area of being repeatable, since they're only done one time and the documentation is not available, they're not actually very repeatable. They're not actually very reviewable, so they probably don't meet the definition for being scientific. As for meaning, that determines whether or not it's meaningful for you. There are some things that have been recently tested in, in this environment Tests of time and response. Um, sometimes tests for a home user environment are performed and they're applied in an analysis to the corporate environment. I think that we need to consider how an outbreak is actually measured. We need to look at how your systems are updated. It's not likely in a large corporation that you go out and get your updates for antivirus off the World Wide Web and you wait till somebody puts up a signature and that's when you first hear about the virus. You probably know about the virus a long time before that you hear about it, you probably get paged sometime in the night. Somebody says, oh, you know, we're seeing some unusual traffic. Some sensors are picking up this or that. So you already know about it. You're not waiting to read about it on the website. When we think about response, we have to think about what that actually means and how you get your information. Interpreting the test in this environment, particular environment, is difficult. If you look, you see the strengths are actually the weaknesses, and the weaknesses are actually the strengths. It's academic, that's great. But it's academic. That's kind of not great because it means the tests are being done by students on the one hand. On the other hand, the students have lots of time and they're really focused on this particular task. So by its nature, being an academic, it's exploratory. It's not really defined process. The language is great if you happen to speak that language. The language is not great if you don't. Testing lots of things is wonderful, but testing lots of things can be bad because you don't have time to, to focus real in depth on anything. Interpretation can be great if it interprets data in light of your environment can be not so great if it's specific to another environment. There's lots of data. We all like to have lots of data, but I think probably we're all kind of tired of having lots of data anymore. There's so much to read through that we cannot possibly do it. 
So we have to rely, rely on the interpretation, which we may not be able to read. And instead, we can only read the scores on the door at the very end of the test, which doesn't really tell us a lot about how the test was done or how meaningful that information is to us. The tests are very environment specific. That's great if it's your environment. It's not great if it's not your environment. One problem, uh, mistake I, I find people often make is they'll read a test and say, oh, it says the product will perform this way. It's not, the test wasn't even done in their environment. So the test results don't actually apply. Test being thorough is wonderful. Test being thorough can be a real problem at the same time. You can see the strengths are also the weaknesses. This tester, uh, Mr. Andres Clemente, is relatively new. He's worth mentioning here because the results are starting to be looked at by some magazines. He's a new tester. He does not yet have access to the In the Wild Wild Course samples when I last spoke with him. Um, his samples are not repli replicated, so um, he's using primarily DOS samples. Most people are not running MS-DOS 3.3 or 5.0 anymore. I prefer DOS 3.3, I think, to all the DOSes. Is anybody here still running MS-DOS on their computers? No, so these tests probably don't apply. But this is new, and again, it points out the sorts of things that happen in the university and academic environments where the equipment maybe isn't quite as up, up to date. Again, we have specialist testers who do antivirus research and have a real focus on this sorts of things. They have track records of doing this sort of work, and they're already performing these tests. And we have commercial organizations. Now, these are very interesting, and these are the ones that you probably have the most Im impact or the most interaction with. The first of, uh, thing we'll look at, ICSA Labs, Virus Bullet, and Checkmark are the three that we'll discuss. ICSA Labs is affiliated with True Secure Corporation, and they do a certifications of a number of products. The vendors belong to a consortia, um, which discuss what these criteria need to be when, as they're developed. And ICSA also offers other services that you may or may not also be using. But you may look for their sticker on the box. The Virus Bulletin is a magazine, again, a very good magazine, which talks about viruses. They also organize a conference. They're also owned by the same people who own the Sophos Antivirus Company. The Checkmark also publishes a magazine, and they sell a number of services and certification. As you can imagine, because the ICSA labs and Checkmark, more so than Virus Bulletin, have an enormous amount of data to process. So what they're giving you in the certification is a really small section of how the product performs. And again, these tests are performed sporadically every month, every other month. You, every, every platform is not tested every month. So when you look at test results, you'll, you'll, you'll have to sort of peck around to find the thing that applies to you. Um, the In the Wild tests, all three of these groups do the In the Wild tests. The Checkmark organization does not do a zoo test. The two groups that do In the Wild tests are that do zoo tests don't actually do weighting of the zoos. So again, you can miss a chunk of a certain virus type and not be aware of what that is. You do have to get 100% of the viruses that are found in the wild to achieve these certifications and some percentage of the zoo tests. I, I think it's 90% of a zoo from ICSA. I'm not sure what the virus bulletin zoo, zoo, zoo testing is or if they're <laughs> what it is. Um, Detection and disinfection. These often come as different modules. A product can be certified that it will detect all the viruses, and it, yet it hasn't been certified that it will disinfect the viruses. So when you see a sticker, or you see in a magazine that it's ICSA certified or has a check mark, it doesn't mean that it's been certified to do everything. It means it's been certified to do one very specific thing that you need to look very carefully at to see if that's the thing you're concerned with. The tests are not with malicious software and Trojan horses, unless you get a, a different certification. I believe some of uh, ICSA and Checkmark do offer a, a Trojan horse certification, which again is just done against huge collections of known Trojan horses. Uh, but when you look at the ICSA certified or the VB100 or the Checkmark, these are, these are just the in the wild viruses. And with, with Virus Bulletin, you have something additional. Um, and ICSA labs, you have the false positive criteria as well. Polymorphic samples are generated by these groups, some samples more than others. When you have a polymorphic virus, that's when a virus looks one way, and each time it replicates, it looks slightly different. So a scanner may detect it when it looks this way, but it won't detect it when it looks this way. You have to generate thousands and thousands and thousands of samples before you come up with one the scanner might miss. So, of course, people aren't going to sit all day replicating polymorphic viruses. So there's a, a certain number organizations may have, and, 
and virus bulletin generally has a, uh, a larger number of these polymorphic replicants than the other groups. Um, so two things that aren't being measured, response times and the synergistic or holistic effect, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. Pros and cons of these organizations. There's some peer review. These groups all work with the different vendors as they develop their tests. There's some documentation. You can go on the websites of these vendors and read exactly how these tests are done and how they're not done. You can look at performance over time by looking through the history of these organizations. Some of them actually have it online where you can look and see when people have passed and when people have failed. There's some interpretation of the test, but primarily that's just the sticker on the box is your interpretation. Virus Bulletin offers a little chunk of summary text of interpretation. These are very, very good baselines for the minimum thing that a product needs to do. Products should be able to detect all the viruses found in the wild because these are the viruses the organization is most likely to come up against. Now you say, well, but that's after the fact. The wild list comes out and then the products are tested. But what these are are snapshots of performance over time. And if you look at how product performs over time, you'll get a very much more realistic view of that product than just looking at one single test. Now the cons are, of course, it's only a good baseline. It's only a starting place. There's the issue of non-weighted samples. Uh, in the case of some non-existent zoos, in the case of some non-existent false positives, these pro are all products done in the default configuration, so you don't actually know from a test how it will perform when it is configured for your organization. And there are sometimes differences. When you start tweaking around the configurations, you may find the performance changes. You won't know that from these tests because these tests are addressing default configurations. They're the timing of the tests, obvious, and the fact that in some cases people are just using disk images, which uh, makes things interesting. And there are sometimes some test discrepancies, which we're going to take a look at in just a moment. General magazine tests have the same criteria for what makes a good test. Is the criteria sound? Is the methodology scientific and reliable? Is it valid? Does it measure the thing it purports to measure? Does it do so reliably? And what is the expertise of the tester? So when you read a review, you always need to think, keep in mind, who did this test? And how is this data being interpreted? We want to take a look at some magazine reviews, some general magazine reviews. And these are some of the comments that, that were in the magazines, which I think are of particular interest. Um, we were confident the software would detect known viruses. Some, some of these, I'm not sure what, what's going on with that. Um, as we'll see in a little while, the software doesn't always detect all, non -virus, all known viruses. The fact that a magazine would make this assumption and you're relying on the magazine that makes this assumption can be possibly a not good situation. One other comment said, that led us to download test software from ICAR, a harmless text in a Microsoft Word file, a comma zipped, blah, blah, blah. These files, and in red it says, behave like viruses and as such should be picked up by virus scanning software. Now certainly, the ICAR test file should be picked up by the antivirus software, but it's not because the file behaves like a virus. It doesn't behave like a virus. It doesn't replicate. That a magazine puts this in when it describes the file sheds some question on the credibility of the technical competency of the reviewer, or at least the person doing the interpretation. These tests tend to look from a home user perspective. They think email, lack of Email protection is a flaw, which I would certainly agree if that's what you're testing, which they weren't in this case, and emphasis on usability versus detection. And that's good. Usability is important. We looked at some magazines and we found that while you may not be aware you're relying on these academic tests that we talked about from University of Hamburg and University of Magdeburg, and you may think, you know, you've never really looked at the tests, but you do read the reviews, many of these re reviewers and reviews look at the results done by these testers. They're not actually doing the test. They're getting reports from ex external labs, from Virus Bullet and ICSA, University of Hamburg, AB test. They perform some malware tests on their own, often getting samples from the internet, which they cannot verify, actually replicate. They cannot verify that they actually do anything remotely viral or destructive, but they go to a website that says coolviruses.com or whatever. They get this stuff, they scan it. They say, oh, the product missed three samples. Well. Sometimes we're able to verify with those editors that those samples were text files. We didn't want to detect them. Uh, those samples were just, they just terminated. They did nothing. But yet when you read the review, you see vendors penalized for not detecting all the samples. They shouldn't, they should actually be rewarded for not detecting all. Um, sometimes Trojans are downloaded, again, from the internet with no idea of whether or not they're actually things people are likely to come up in the real world in any given environment. They're just sort of thrown out there to the wind and tested. 
Um, primarily, this magazine tested on-demand aspects of scanners, analyzed the performance from the home user point of view, and, and talked about scanning in zip archives. These are very, very useful things to do, and talked about detecting spyware, adware, and dialers. These particular di dialers, again, were all German dialers, but the magazine wasn't a German magazine. Um, if we look a number of magazines downstream, we see that many of these magazines are now using these tests from the universities. So they're using tests that are done primarily by students in an academic environment. And in some cases, they're using tests by uh, some of the commercial organization. And you can, I won't go over all of them because I want to get to the examples, which I think you'll find very interesting. There are just lots of them there. In one case, we found that the, the, the statistics that they used were from Virus Bolt, and they were actually inaccurately cited. Timing is everything. Here we show one product tested by a number of organizations. We weren't able to ascertain from the organization yet why they were going upscale in the, in the version releases, and suddenly they went back to testing a product version 3.0. We don't know, but as you can see from the way the tests are timed, it's possible for a product to fail one place, take care of that problem, and then go be tested in, at another place. You think with all these people doing tests, they would all tend to come up with the same results because the goal is to be valid and to be reliable. But when we looked at 65 products done, produced by 39 vendors over a period of four years, we found that people don't always agree. They don't always just get along. Out of 45 reports, we found that ICSA was saying something opposite to other people two times. Virus Bulletin, out of 22 reports, 13 times they agreed, nine times they disagreed with others. From Checkmark, 46 times they agreed. 46 tests, 40 times they agreed, six times they didn't, and University of Magdeburg was disagreeable one time. So if you look at that at the distribution, you see that, I guess you could say that Virus Bulletin is the most disagreeable of all magazines. Um, they had the most discrepancies and found the most problems with others. And we're going to look at some of those. But we did go first to Matt Ham from Virus Bulletin and ask him some questions. Why are you so disagreeable? Why is it that your tests say things other people don't say? And he told us that sometimes Virus Bulletin has less lead time between wild lists and the de test deadline, so this can make a difference. They only wait two days before they do their test. They may make many more polymorphic samples. Um, they use a lot of different file extensions, which other testers may not use, may not be testing. And sometimes a product may de detect a virus by default using one file extension, and a different file extension, virus doesn't even look, the scanner doesn't even look, doesn't find it at all, which is a real problem. Like see, that's going, yes, it's a real problem. Um, floppy samples, sometimes actual diskettes can be a little bit harder to uh, detect virus on, upon. Not all have false positive criteria, so since VB has false positive criteria, um, they're likely to catch somebody who has a false positive better than somebody who doesn't even have their criteria. Some have no zoo criteria. And some people test and test and retest and retest and retest. And the products are allowed to keep testing until they get it right. Then we went out and asked some comments in the field. I'm, I'm in a really enviable position. I can go out and ask all of my colleagues that work for other companies what they think about these tests. And if they had something that they would say to, to you all to, to get you thinking about tests, what would they like to say? These are the things they wanted to say. When you look at magazine tests, especially when they're combined with commercial testers, sometimes a tester will create a test, sell it many, many, many times, such as 15 times over four to six months, and the magazine claims that they tested it. The general public thinks this is continuing bad product, that the product happened to have a bad time that one day. So you can read, in this particular case, somebody must have had this happen to them because he mentioned the actual numbers 15 different times, you're thinking a product has a problem when it's only one problem that was fixed immediately, but because the test was resold, the test information was resold many times, you've read about it everywhere you look. It's like, oh, this must be a bad product. Everything they do is bad. It was really just one incident. Sometimes, in a review of the same product, you can be best in one magazine and worst in another. You know, how does that happen? Magazine testers should demand that they can see a publication before it goes to print, but they can't always do that. That's how that happens. And sometimes, the, with the magazines, we're not actually able to ver verify whether the samples were actually viral, who did the test, and they only share that information if you fail, and sometimes not even then. So those are things to keep in mind when you read the magazine test and you assess whether or not you want to rely on them. The issue of waiting, which we've talked about very briefly. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the ITSEC model for um, certifying antivirus products. Basically, it says that when you, if you have a huge collection of viruses, you're going to put them in, in types. Currently, if you scan a huge collection of zoos, you may miss 
you may miss 100 out of 100,000. And that seems like not very much. When you organize according to file types, maybe, maybe, maybe there's 100 of a very particular type. And using the ITSEC model, you do organize according to file type. So when you do the scan and you say, oh, you missed 100, and they're all this type. This is a bad thing. This vendor has a problem with this particular file type. There's no weighting going on currently in any of the tests that you read. So when you read a zoo test, or, or any test really, that says we detected all of these viruses, we only missed 100. Those 100 could be 100 of something that's very important or very soon to appear on the scene. You won't know from reading the test because there's no weighting done. And of course the impact on you can be quite huge if that happens to be a file, a file type that you have a lot of in your organization. Now, this wouldn't be a semantic presentation if I didn't talk about blended threats. I think we invented the name. I tried to have a contest once where people invented a drink called the blended threat. Uh, we never did have a winner, but we had lots of submissions, usually a black hat. Um, blended threats, they combine lots of things, generally exploiting vulnerabilities, and they spread really, really fast, and you've probably seen them in your organization. Generally, they'll exploit some vulnerability, often on a web server. You've probably seen that a lot lately. Somebody sends an email. It goes out in the email. Then it exploits another vulnerability, so somebody sitting with their laptop gets exploited. Pretty soon their PC is open, their laptop is open. Pretty soon, not even a vulnerability, just a bad configuration exists on another computer. Everybody's sharing information. Pretty soon the worm is everywhere. Then the traditional viral methods start. Pretty soon all the machines in your organization are owned. The interesting thing about this is that traditional tests of antivirus don't talk at all about the vulnerabilities that were exploited. They don't tell you, is information about that vulnerability part of the solution? For instance, is the information provided by the vendor talking about CVE compatibility? What, what is the vulnerability? What's the bug track ID? Well, what's the Microsoft ID? Nobody's really assessing whether or not that the solution might be some adjunct to the product being tested. Maybe the ultimate solution in the, for the virus that's being tested against isn't going to be that you get your update from the vendor at all. Maybe the response that you need to do is making some magic configuration change. And because you have a relationship with that vendor, they're going to tell you that. You're going to know that really fast. You're not going to wait for two hours or three hours or five hours until you see a signature file. That's good in some cases. But it's more important that you have a relationship with that vendor. So when these things start happening, we can say, you know, you need to turn off this port. This is on. You don't need to have this on. Do you really need to have you know, this thing running? Turn it off. Maybe you need to make configuration change. Maybe you need to turn something off. Maybe you need to do something else besides rely on the antivirus product. Solutions are really merging. But in all the antivirus tests, there's really very, very little, if any, talk about the vulnerabilities that exist. That's kind of important. We went out and started looking at some of the tests. And this is the part where you get to look at pictures. It's my favorite part. We found that in this test, and this was a uh, an ICSA labs test. And these are available on the internet. You can go out and, and find them for yourself. And I, I like to think that these are probably typos. And this, the product was tested using a wild list that our signature file that didn't yet exist. So it was tested on the 18th of February using a signature that wasn't written until the 20th. Now that's really proactive. That's really pretty good. And, and we're not immune. I see the same thing happened to us. We were tested on the 18th using a signature file that we didn't even create until the 20th. So that's interesting. We found here that there was a product that was tested in, in January using wildlist that didn't come out until March. And uh, I'm not sure how that happens. But there are, those are typos. And those are just funny little typos that the vendors, uh, that the testers have gone and fixed now. But there are some real problems that aren't just typos, some discrepancies. In one case, I see say passed a product using the December 2001 wild list virus bullet and failed it. Why is that? The on access scanner didn't detect samples of real in the wild viruses that you're likely to get when the samples have certain file extensions. That's a problem if you happen to have files with those file extensions. If you, if you rely solely on the one test result, you're going to think, oh, I'm totally protected. The fact is, you wouldn't be. Second example. Uh, one university said a product failed to detect some samples using a wild list virus bulletin, awarded its award to that. They said probably the A-B test might have used an older signature. This one's kind of explainable. But this one isn't. 
and another unnamed antivirus for Windows 2000. They received a, a checkmark award. Virus Bulletin denied their award using the same wild list. These are all on the same product version. These, it's not that these are different product versions. These are identical product versions using the identical wild list in testing. The failure was the inability of the on-access component to scan packed files. This could be a real problem, but you wouldn't know it if you were relying on just one testing organization. Yet again, Virus Bulletin denied their award to a product based on the July 2001 wild list. ICSA passed the product using the same wild list. The product missed certain extensions again of SIRCAM virus. I don't know how many of you may have gotten infected by SIRCAM virus, but this will be an issue. And, a, and an antivirus product for Windows NT didn't get the BB100 against the wild list. They did get it from Checkmark. We're not sure why. We haven't been able to resolve that one yet. But you shouldn't think people are always inconsistent and don't agree. In some cases, they do agree, and both people or both organizations will fail antivirus software. There is consistency. In one case, an unnamed product for WinME was failed by Virus Bulletin because it didn't detect Win32 ZMIST, an ASP sample of NIMDA on access, PowerPoint, and POT samples of the tri state virus. They were, they were failed by antivirus tests as well, but for a different reason. They were failed because they didn't detect in the wild boot sector viruses, and they missed two samples of Michelangelo on demand. So here's a case where both people say, yes, you failed, but both gave different reasons. In another case, in Virus Bulletin, the product failed to detect bat and link samples of CIRCAM and a DLL sample of, of MTX and some other things. Antivirus tests found they should fail also, but only because they failed to detect the CIRCAM files. And finally, an unnamed product for Windows NT Virus Bulletin found that it failed to detect some NIMDA samples in ZMIST, Michelangelo, and Access, and had a ton of false positives, but it got the award or got the, got the failure from antivirus test because it missed Michelangelo on Access. Now you can see there's some real discrepancies between what the people found was wrong with the product. If you relied on only one of these, you'd, you'd be relying on probably not enough. So closing thoughts. What's tested is really, really obviously very important. A product's ability to detect all the viruses in circulation, that would be the viruses that are on the wild list and the wild core sample set, is really important. You want your product to be able to detect all these viruses. Product's ability to detect some obscure zoo sample is probably, well, because I'm a scientist, I think about statistics a lot, and probably statistically speaking, it's not very important if the antivirus product doesn't detect some obscure zoo virus sample unless it's the sample that's of a particular type that you happen to have a lot of in your organization, which you wouldn't know from these tests because they're not weighted. But what about the ability of the product to detect a virus in some sort of archiver? Well, that's going to be important to you if that's an archiver that you use a lot in your organization. Um, if not, then it's probably not going to be so important to you. But how about to detect a destructive worm that's coming into the network? I think we'd all agree that's probably pretty important. What's not tested, I think, though, is probably, especially now, even more important. We're seeing a lot more uh, written about response times. We've talked about waiting a thousand times. Won't do that again. But response times is really, really important. And I think that the system's impact on detection and what, what we think of as a holistic effect of the problem, it's not just viruses anymore. It's viruses is merged in with security. So we have the blended threats, things exploiting vulnerabilities. The tests aren't really examining the vulnerability side of things, the security side of things. The tests don't examine if a non-antivirus-specific solution would have stopped a threat. We don't know from looking at a test whether or not the vendor offers you information about the vulnerability. We don't know if the right response may have been reconfiguration of firewall or user response. So the fact that it didn't detect this thing with some signature, it may not even be possible to detect it with some signature, but we don't know that from looking at tests. We just see this thing was in the wild, it failed. But in reality, your organization would have been totally and completely protected because of your relationship with that vendor. You're getting information from that vendor. You know you need to do this thing. You don't, you don't need to rely on the test in that particular situation. The tests aren't really looking at the vulnerability aspect of things. So what does this mean to you? It means there are tests out there. You can see there are lots of tests. There are ICSA certifications. There are Virus Bullet 100s. There are Secure Computing check marks. There's University of Hamburg, University of Magdeburg, PC World, PC Test, CHIP, all these different magazines, and you influence them directly and indirectly. When you, when you see, read that magazine review, you're actually being influenced by work that's been done in the university, not just, not just the idea of somebody who's writing the magazine review. 
You, so you can be influenced directly or indirectly. All these tests have strength, lots of strength, very good, very good baselines. Um, they're all basically really good tests, but they all have weaknesses. And as you can see, when you compare and contrast them together, some of those weaknesses can be quite serious for you in your organization. And bottom line is a good test has to be scientific and meaningful. Many of these tests can be scientific, some not quite so scientific. They can still be a little meaningful, but they have to be both in order to be really good tests. And meaningful is something that will really vary from person to person. It's not going to be the same for everyone. You may not care if something detects everything within a zip archive because you may never have anything within a zip archive in your organization. There's actually a paper which was supposed to be shipped here by network security but hasn't gotten here yet. It's called Seven Simple Rules for Evaluating Antivirus Software Tests. Uh, it is published in Network Security Magazine and you can get a copy of it or you can email me and I'll direct you on how to get a copy of it. I only, I do have email copies of it I could send to you as a PDF file. Talks about what makes a test reliable, what makes a test valid, what makes a test scientific. Um, basically it talks about how to apply the rules for antivirus tests across the scope of people who do tests, be they academics or the magazine tests or the commercial organizations that you're relying on. That's my email address, um, sgordon at semantic.com. And if you have any questions, you can email me there. I have lots of other papers and information about testing. And if you look in your little book, you'll see the slides there are much more shorter slides because I tend to use way too many slides because I talk so fast and I just race through everything. So if you see your slides are really short and you want any information from any of these more in-depth slides, if you contact me, I'll be happy to get those to you. And I think according to the official Naval Observatory time, we have just a couple of minutes left. If anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to answer them if I know the answers, and if not, I'll find out for you, and I'll get the information back to you. Yes? I think that there is some move afoot to do some sort of development assurance criteria in antivirus. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's going to be a slow process. I did some work with the UK IT sec folks along the same lines. And I think that's going to be quite a while before it's done, even after it's initially done, because the products are really dynamic. You know, you can you can say that it, this version works, but you're going to have a new version. And you may find that even across the platforms, the product will not perform the same across the platforms. So I think that that's a, it's a real good way to go, but it's going to be a long time before those processes are really documented enough that it's meaningful. And so we will see products that have that sort of certification, but I wouldn't attach too much, <laughs> other than that everybody has one more check box for their check mark for their box. Yeah. Sometimes requiring things doesn't mean that the thing that's required provides the use that one would hope. <laughs> The specialist testers, such as Florida Institute of Technology and Security Innovation, they do that sort of test, but they're, because those sorts of tests are very environment specific, it's not the sort of thing that a magazine would go out and do. Uh, they may not actually have the resource, or they need access to your corporate environment to tell what you would do, and it's probably you're not going to give access to your environment to those testers. So those tests are available, but they're not the ones you would read about. University of Toronto doing is that University of Calgary? John Acock? Is that University? Yes, University of Cal um, No, I haven't seen any tests coming out of there at all. I haven't really heard much more about their course. And the, you're talking about the course where they had students experiment with the malicious right. code in the controlled lab environment. You know, I haven't heard anything more about testing from that organization. It's very specialized. Okay, well, I think that's all. I think our time is up. And thank you very much. You can email me if you have any questions.